Um, so dyslexia is a language-based reading disability. So we're going to talk a little bit about oral language. So oral language is um, our first in the knowledge and skills that we use to produce spoken language or understand spoken language. Um, and our language skills are our foundation for learning to read and write. Remember when I said I was a baby speech path and I just began working in the schools and I couldn't figure out why all my little people that had trouble with articulation, learning speech sounds, were also struggling readers, um, especially as kindergarten and first grade. And their teachers would come to me and they would say, I think something's wrong. And I would say, I think something's wrong too, but they should be able to learn how to read because they're they're IQ, you know, they're smart kids. Um, and so <coughs> that, is, that is what we were dealing with. Oral language is composed, composed of five main components. So phonology, so understanding um, that speech sounds uh, make up words. Morphology is more about the meaning of words um, and the parts of words, so how you break down pieces of words. Semantics, I mean, meaning, um, you know, you talk about um, semantics as being um, what you say and what you mean, that's semantics. Syntax is grammar, basic, kind of. Um, and pragmatics is the understanding of language. So all of those pieces together make up oral language. Um, and kids with dyslexia struggle with phonological, the phonological pieces of language, which is a ton of that. So the phonological awareness, um, just knowing that different letters, different sounds are, are created and um, that there are, there are differences in the sounds themselves. That phonological, oh, gosh, <clears throat> phonological memory, um, so just being able to remember which sounds go with which letters, which uh, names of letter names, parts of words, entire words. Um, word retrieval. Sometimes this is a huge issue with me. I have to say I'm a speech pathologist with word finding difficulties. So I think that's my phonological retrieval sometimes stinks. And a lot of the time, my phonolog phonological production stinks because I, there are words that I have not been able to say today. Um, but those pronunciations of multisyllabic words, um, the longer words, but sometimes short words get me too. So, um, Individuals with dyslexia um, may also have problems with vocabulary and grammar. Um, there's an app or um, a program called Grammarly um, that you can get a lot of our individuals, our kids, and especially adults with dyslexia use Grammarly, especially those that write a lot use Grammarly to help check their work. <clears throat> um, oral language impairments also make it more difficult for our kids, uh, puts our kids at risk for difficulties in reading comprehension, again, because of those word memory skills. Um, those vocabulary skills, again, when you're having to learn all of those things and that's, you're learning the differences between sounds and to be able to identify those differences between sounds, it makes learning vocabulary and syntax and grammar all that more difficult. So that's a little bit about oral language. I talked a little bit about ADHD being a comor comor cor bleh, comorbid condition. Um, with dyslexia, but there are other things too. Um, some kids with autism also have dyslexia, so that makes that even more difficult. Visual issues, like I said, it's not the visual um, acuity, that's not the deal, um, but some kids do have oral motor, visual motor differences, um, but that again is different than dyslexia, but it can be in addition to. Uh, the language and communication, I already mentioned articulation, um, a processing delay, just being able to hear things, being able to process it and being able to give it back, um, that can be very difficult. Again, coordination of motor skills. <clears throat> Auditory processing, I kind of lump that into the processing delay. Um, interrupted learning, they may have spurts 
of learning um, where things are a little bit easier for them, not because of their neurological condition, but it's just because you're covering something that they're able to grasp a little bit differently. Um, their social emotional skills may be a little bit delayed. Um, you'll see low abilities in some areas and really high abilities in other areas. And then dyscalculia is the difficulties with math and dysgraphia is a difficulty with writing. So here's the dysgraphia information. Um, one of this is, I love this little piece um, that a kid wrote. Dysgraphia is not just about bad handwriting, but it is a motor planning issue. So again, it can interfere, um, but it is a condition of impaired letter writing by hand. Um, so it's not just your kids that have bad handwriting, because a lot of kids have bad, bad handwriting. A lot of doctors have bad handwriting these days. Um, but it, it's, again, putting that together, that neurological component of what is this letter supposed to look like? What's it supposed to sound like? And how am I gonna get it on this piece of paper? So it, it's a bit of, more about the processing. And then we've already talked about spelling. Again, um, it's an orthographic coding issue, um, and, um, and again, it, it, it is more about the motor piece and motor planning. And again, I put up the slide about dysgraphia. You'll see a lot of those same things exist if a kid that has dyslexia often dysgraphia is a little bit about, is a little bit in their life as well. So one statistic is about 30 to 50% of children with reading disabilities also have ADHD. Um, it's probably on the upper end of that. Um, and if you have ADHD, let me just say it's hard to learn how to read because you have to sit still to do it. Um, you have to concentrate to do it. You have to practice to do it. It just doesn't come easy for a lot of us. And so if you have ADHD and you already know that being focused and attending to instruction is hard, um, then learning to read is hard as well. Again, ADHD, like dyslexia, is neurologically based. Um, and when, again, to describe or to identify that, we want to look at these characteristics that happen over a period of time, whether we're looking at distractibility, impulsivity, or hyperactivity. For my daughter, I pick on her a lot because I have experience with her. Um, I went to her doctor when she was three years old and said, she has, she has ADHD. I don't want you to do anything about it. I just want you to write it down that mom thinks she has it. <laughs> and he did. And I went back when she turned four and I said, I still want you to put in her chart that she has ADHD or that I think she has ADHD. And he did. Um, and we, we did, went through that process every year. Um, and we started medication with her, and again, it's different for every kid with ADHD, and I'm not saying what our experience has been should be anybody else's. We started medication with her in first grade, not in second semester of first grade even, not because she was having difficulty learning or that it was affecting her schoolwork, but it was affecting her socially. She was missing social cues, and when friends or kids would get mad or frustrated like first graders do she just she didn't clue in and so um, she was just missing a lot of um, things that were going on with her friends and she started to lose friends and that was a, a big that was a problem for me <laughs> um, she still to this day is very impulsive um, and so as a 13 year old going on 14 later this month that's very scary to have a daughter that's very impulsive and is going to be driving in a couple of years and probably have some experiences with boyfriends and things like that. And so um, that's kind of one of the areas that we're working a lot on in our life right now. But you'll see your kids with dyslexia may display some of the same characteristics. Um, for her, she used to be very hyperactive, but not so much anymore. She's kind of learned in mediate that um, she knows when she needs to get up and wiggle again we've taught her to advocate for herself so if she needs to not distract her class she needs to go stand in the back of the classroom and wiggle around um, she's able to do that she's able to ask to do that 
um, when she was in first, well, pretty much all of her elementary school is great with, with working with her, as most elementary teachers are. And a lot of them had standing desks in the back of the classroom or something like that. So she could just go, any kid could go back there, but she did a lot, I know, they would tell me. Um, and not to cause problem, but just she worked better standing up or bent over a table. When she would come home and do her homework when she was younger, she would hang upside down in the recliner and read upside down like that. Um, I just got used to it. I, I hardly ever used to make her sit still to read or do her homework. Um, it's a little bit different now because I need to teach her to focus a little bit more, but, um, but that's something that we're working on. Um, auditory books, talking about assistive technology, that's something that we use a ton in our house. One, because I'm on the road a lot and I, I like Audible and I love those kind of things, but she's learned to love that too. And so she can do two or three things and listen to a book at the same time. And so that helps us get through some of the novels and things like that that she needs to read for school is I'll buy it for her on Audible. Um, Bookshare, I'm sure that um, Able Tech mentioned Bookshare to you. Uh, that's another um, um, auditory app that reads, not an app, it's a program that reads books um, but there's a ton of textbooks on there. I think there's about, I can't remember what she said, between 750 and 800,000 books there now on Bookshare. And it's a free service for students with reading disabilities. Um, and you can sign up through that, for that, for your students through your school district. So if you need help with that, contact me, contact Jill. We'll get you in touch with the person and, um, there's usually someone in each district that has an account and that can get your kids set up. So especially for your kids, uh, for you guys that have secondary students, they, uh, most of the textbooks that Oklahoma uses are in Bookshare and you can't, and they can be read to your students. So that's a huge thing. I don't know why I said that with the ADHD stuff, but it popped in, so I'm gonna use that there. Working memory, so let's talk a little bit about working memory. Um, just because it's so important to learning. We all use working memory every day. Some of us are better than others at using it. Um, we use it in different ways, um, but it's crucial for learning and it just gives us the ability. It's kind of like our short-term memory. Memory. It's the memory that we have that we can use and I can say, write down three plus three equals 29 and you can write that down, and even though you know three plus three does not equal 29, you can still write that down and remember that. So that's kind of working memory. Um, it's memory that we must go beyond. So we have to do something with the information. Um, so like listening, remembering, following directions for multiple steps. So again, you'll have your kids that you say, um, I'm going to talk about your own personal kids for a minute if you have them. If you say, go to your room, pick up your tennis shoes, grab some socks, come back here, put them on, and then we're going to go to the store or whatever. And they might go to their room and not come back for half an hour. <laughs> um, or, you know, they've forgot their socks and have to make another trip upstairs. But that's the working memory. And so we see a lot of students with dyslexia that just can't follow that sequence of steps or that process. So that is that. Um, remembering questions long enough to think about them and formulate the answer. So here's the teacher tip here. It's when you ask a question, do not respond to the first kid that raises their hand. You can come back to that kid and, and get that information, but you need to wait an uncomfortable amount of time and then wait till you see one of your slower processors get that light bulb on or raise their hand and then you can choose them or you can choose the person that ants that wrote lifted their hand first or somewhere in between um, but don't always go with the person that's ooh, 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 because you're not giving your slower processors, the kids with slower working memories, long enough to think about it and formulate an answer. We are built on a 
fast working. I've got to move. I've got to, I mean, when you're in the classroom, you've got to keep things going. And when you let a lot of time lapse, yes, you're going to have some kids with some behaviors and things like that. So you need to come up with some ideas that will keep that going. But think through that and think what you can do instead. So one of the things I like to do is keep, keep your answers small. Instead of having kids raise their hand, teach, or teach them to do thumbs up or thumb sideways right in front of them on their desk. So the slower processing kids aren't distracted by Johnny in the front row going, ooh, 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 I know the answer, I know the answer. Okay? Um, whether you do thumbs up, thumbs down, some other sign. Um, I've had teachers that have had um, color-coded cards like, green, yellow, red, and you pick up, you hold up, flash the card if you know the answer, and then you can choose. Um, for your kids with dyslexia, don't pick on, on them to read out loud. Most of them, that scares the daylight out of them. However, know your kids and talk to them. And some of our kids with dyslexia really want to read out loud. They want to be chosen to read out loud. And it may be that you and them or you and mom or dad can practice on a, reading a page or reading a paragraph or reading something, but they've practiced it. They know it in advance. And so you've got it planned that, hey, when we get to this section, it's going to be your turn to read. And so they can be prepared for that. So for those kids that, you, that, that want to read, that struggle, let them do that, but give them the tools to do it successfully. Um, recipe steps, uh, mental arithmetic, super hard for me. Uh, working memory is limited in both capacity and duration. Again, remember, when you're thinking of a phone number, of a <coughs> random number that you haven't seen before, you can remember it. Most people can remember it long enough to write it down. But for folks with working memory difficulties, I might remember the area code or the first few numbers or the last couple of numbers, but they're going to miss out a chunk in the middle. So for working memory in the classroom, um, and this is for kids with dyslexia, but you'll see this with other students as well, um, and kids with ADHD. Um, they may perform below average in some areas of learning. They may have difficulty with complex <coughs> reasoning. Again, that's that working memory piece. So that's what I'm saying. Give them long enough to process before you start moving on to the next step or before you start letting someone else answer the question. Because they may know the answer and they may be able to get to the answer, but if you don't give them time, then you're kind of defeat you're kind of defeating them there again we talked about tasks that involve more than one step they may have lost track of what they're supposed to do so they just stop and then they can't get started again that's really frustrating um, you may see kids enjoy um, engage in daydreaming um, again organizational skills think through how we can help support those kids through those processes um, visuals Huge, huge, huge. Just because a kid can read or just because a kid can understand my verbal instructions, if I give them a visual, then everybody in my classroom is going to be able to respond to that. My high flyers and my kids that struggle with working memory. If you give visuals, everybody can benefit from that. So this is huge when we talk about daydreaming, skills and organizational and planning and losing track. When you've got kids that are losing track of what they're supposed to do next, if you've got a chart of that in a visual on the board, whether a kid can read or write, they know what to do next. Keep your whole group on, t on track with that. Um, we talked about oral directions, thinking and doing things at the same time. They may appear highly distractible inattentive, but again, what are they able to work with? What are we looking at here? Again, demonstrate low self-esteem because they've just never been able to get to the point where they can show off. Um, they may have close relationships with some of their friends, but 
struggle in, in larger groups, mainly because you've got kids talking and things going on, um, and so they don't do so well in a big group setting. So think of that when you're looking at group projects, and think of your kids that have those slower working memory times, and not necessarily put them all together, but you may put them in a bit of a smaller group instead of a bigger group. Don't put them all in the same group. Just the thing. Some supports, some classroom supports. Again, I already mentioned visuals. That's my biggest one. Um, all kids can benefit from visuals. Um, again, keep track of those students that you know are a little bit slower processing or have trouble with that working memory. And you can kind of, you will learn to see it with, in their eyes. Again, relationships are huge with your students there. Reduce the amount of information that needs to be stored. Again, if you can have information on a whiteboard, or if you can give them notes ahead of time, um, you're going to increase what they take in overall. Um, to chunk information or to simplify it to make it easier to process. Um, so when I give you way too many words, I know Jill doesn't give you so many words when she teaches, um, but you'll see that in from your experiences too, we chunk information in bits and pieces so that you're kind of able to remember, hey, we talked about this with this situation, we talked about this with that situation. Um, teach students how to use your assistive technology and or your memory aids. So if you have a multiplication chart, teach kids how to use it. Don't assume they're gonna get it from osmosis. The same thing with assistive technology. Um, just because you put something in front of a kid in Bookshare app, or if you use a visual organizer, if you use um, uh, rulers, if you use a C-pen, whatever assistive technology, don't expect it to work fabulous on day one. Know that you need to know how to use it, but you also need to give your students time to learn how to use it effectively. Um, one and done is not a good thing for, for our students with working memory issues, our students with dyslexia, or our students that need dyslex um, assistive technology. Give it time. Um, you guys have probably heard this before, but one of the mantras that I stand on time and time and time again is that our kids don't learn good behavior by osmosis. Some of them do. Some of them do but a lot of our kids need to be taught our expectations in the classroom. We can't just assume that because we put no talking up on our little rule checklist that they're gonna know and understand and be able to follow that rule. So let's practice it. Let's talk about what that means. Communicate with your kids about what that means. Repeat information, keep directions simple, provide examples. Um, so there's not one way to fix working memory, um, but there are a lot of things that we can do to support it. So let's talk a little bit more about accommodations. One of the huge pieces, one of the huge takeaways from our student panels um, in our dyslexia workshop has been hearing what students say um, accommodations benefit them, what works for them. You've got kids that are having um, C's, lower C's, making C's and D's on paper with appropriate accommodations can make A's, B's, upper C's. And so that's what we want to see. Um, so our teachers, um, I mean our students talk a lot about they just need extra time. I love what Dr. Shaywood says is that a dyslexia robs a person of time and accommodations can give them back, can give that back to them. Um, so it takes so much longer for them to process that a B is a B and it makes the buzz sound and I'm sounding out the word baseball. It doesn't just come naturally. So I have to use the interventions, I have to use the skills that I have in place to learn to sound out that word and then I have to do something with that word. It's not just click, it's there. And so give extra time. Um, you use that quiet space as much as you can. Our classrooms aren't quiet. They're noisy. They're busy. Kids are up and moving. I completely get it. 
but especially when we're looking at tests, um, either chunk test up or give them a quiet place to work on those. The option to record lectures, I know different schools feel differently about students having the ability to record in the classroom, so know your district policy on that. Um, but again, if it's an assistive technology measure, and, and especially in college, they can record their lectures. That is an acceptable thing for any student, not just our students with learning disabilities. So how can we use that the same in our, uh, especially in our secondary? Um, give, get the option to give verbal um, test oral answers instead of in writing. You will be shocked, I guarantee you. You will be shocked if you have your kids, especially with learning disabilities, and some of your kids with other disabilities as well, if you give them the opportunity to come to you and say, tell me what you know, what do you know about this, you know, do the test with them verbally, yes, it takes extra time, but yes, that's why we're here. That's what we do as special educators is to provide that extra time. And if you can um, hear what they know verbally, you will be astounded at probably at what they've taken away. Now, I will say that, but you do have to ask the questions correctly as well. Um, if you give them yes, no questions, you're going to get yes, no answers. Um, if you give them pieces of questions, if you give them a question with six parts, they're not gonna be able to respond to all six parts. They're gonna leave something out. So break it up. Give them smaller chunks of questions and give, let them answer orally. Um, I've already mentioned eliminate oral reading in class. Um, again, some of our, I can't say that as a blanket say, statement because some of our kids really want the ability, want the opportunity to read orally, but again, you just need to have those discussions, those conversations privately, not in front of the class, please, um, with your kids. One of our student um, panel kids said that he was so embarrassed because um, his teacher would say, class, I need someone to read this for Sam. I need someone to read this out loud for Sam. Read it again for Sam. And poor Sam was like, I don't want, I mean, he was okay with the person reading that, but he didn't want the whole class to know that. Um, or he was okay with the teacher reading out loud or whatever, or his, his um, headphones hooked into his, um, Chromebook or whatever, um, but to constantly pick on and use the student's name associated with a derogatory comment like somebody needs to do it for him because he can't do it, um, that, that's derogatory. Um, an exemption from foreign, foreign language learning, um, you know, graduation requirements in Oklahoma either have a foreign language or some kind of computer class and a lot of times our students can successfully master the computer classes, but the foreign language learning, when you're already struggling with one language, it makes it awfully hard to, to add that to it. Again, that's not for every kid, but for some kids that makes it a little hard. You guys aren't gonna be able to read this, but again, I wanted to include it for you, but it's just some other accommodations um, for our kids with dyslexia and kind of, um, what the challenge is, so if the challenge is reading out loud, um, you might lower the audience size. If that's a skill that you really need to work on for that student, um, you might have the student read with you, not read to another kid, um, those kind of things. Um, I love this, be intentional about the groups that you create with your kids. Um, quiet reading, the text-to-speech apps are super, taking notes, Again, use your notes as a teacher. Let them use your notes. Um, that's not cheating. Um, solving math problems, again, use visual supports, organizational kit skills. Think about what environmental changes you can bring in. Um, you know, does color coding things help? What kind of binder works for kids? Um, my worst situation as a special, ed not my worst, one of the worst situations I had as a special ed director was I had a general ed teacher um, give a kid who was trying his darndest on an assignment. Um, I can't remember if the grade was a 20 or a 30, um, but it was a big assignment. And there was a rubric involved. 
um, and he was a kid with some organizational issues. He had a little bit lower IQ, um, but he was in a general ed class with resource room supports. And so when he turned, he, their paper was due on a certain day. She asked for it at the beginning of the class period, and um, he didn't have it. He couldn't find it. He was rifling through his backpack, couldn't find it. He found it by the end of the class. He didn't have time during the class to do the whole assignment, but he found it by the end of the class. He turned it in. So she took off 10 points for it being late. Turned it in within the same class period, okay? She took off 10 points because he used spiral paper instead of loose leaf paper. That was on the rubric. That was her response. Um, she took off 10 points because he used a staple on it. That was on the rubric. No staples. She took off 10 points for that. Um, there was one other thing um, that she took off. So at this point, his highest grade is a 60. And then she took off points for the actual assignment um, that he had done with the resource teacher. Um, and so he was devastated when he made a 20 or 30 on this paper that he had worked on for weeks. <clears throat> and so I say those things. If you've got a teacher like that and they're out there and we work with them, um, Number one, try to educate them on what accommodations are. Um, to me, I don't care what kind of paper you turn it in on. You turn it in within you know, a reasonable amount of time, yay, great. He actually had the extended time as one of his accommodations, so that shouldn't have been accounted for at all. And I just think it was mean to count off for the stapler and the loose leaf paper. I, there's no excuse for that in my book. Um, she's not a teacher anymore, I'll just say that. Oh, but one of the things that we've learned through some of our, like, with the differentiated learning and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. I have some teachers at my school that are like that, and then I have other ones that are like, I don't know, you tell me what we need to do for this kid. And those things work, but talk to the kid. What works for the kid, especially if you're in the secondary area, right. um, they may can tell you things that they can do and they want that expectation placed on them where you might have put the bar down here. And they might not have the bar up here. They're not all going to try to get away with the easiest thing to do. Um, and I'm all about rubrics. I, rubrics. I do believe those are helpful for our kids. It provides a checklist. This is kind of what we expect. Um, but we can have accommodations within those. Um, but for organizational, everybody is a little bit different. I need my calendar. I need things written out for me. I need my list. Um, I like my colored pens. Those things work really well for me. Um, colored pens and cute paper work really well for my daughter. She's a lot more able and willing to keep herself organized for things like that. So I'll go buy the stupid pink paper because it's cute, not because she needs pink paper. Um, boys are probably a little different than that. I've never had boys, so I don't know. Um, but, you know, if it is using a binder effective, is it just the kids got to have the backpack with them and they got to be able... Um, Google Classroom has helped us tremendously, um, especially with uh, my daughter's absences at schools and her teachers know um, that if she's not there and I've called in and said this is... I mean, they're shooting it to her in Google Classroom and she's able to do most of it. Um, on her own that's that's a little bit her and her bent but that's not every kid's bent um, so you just kind of you've got to know your kids you've got to build relationships um, we talked about following directions chunking things up into smaller chunks to do you've got those kids that, especially our kids with dyslexia I'm overwhelmed I, do, do any of your districts still use Storytown in the elementary level for reading good um, Abby would come home with, you know, or some of my students too, 12 or 13 page chapter test at the end of the week, um, front and back, and I'm like, she's a pretty typical bright kid, and I, just to look at that big chunk of paper for a second, third, or fourth grade student, I would have been overwhelmed. Yes, it's big writing and all of those things, but give me one page at a time, or half a page at a time. So what can you do to chunk things up? I much, completely what I said a while ago, you guys don't think about those 15,000 words. You will destroy yourself. Do it one piece or one paragraph at a time. 
don't even look at your word count till you're done writing. And then if you need to go back in and add a little bit more <coughs> observation, do that. Um, <coughs> it's important for you guys, but it's super important for our kids who don't have um, the organizational skills. Explicit instruction, it's... Um, It's that we are, we are explicitly teaching skills rather than leaving it up to the kid to figure it out on their own. Like I mentioned earlier, we're not teaching kids what we expect of them and their behavior by osmosis. That, that bugs the daylights out of me. Um, we need to be explicit in our instruction with regards to behavior, but also with regards to whatever we're teaching in the classroom setting. Okay. Um, don't just think that they're going to get it. So you teach it, you model it, you practice it, and you let the kid practice it. Um, so the teacher demonstrates the task, provides the guided practice, gives corrective, positive feedback before the student is attempting the task independently. So you've got lots of time to have errors with each other before you're giving it to the student to do on their own. Um, again, you're not going to be able to read this because the print is so small, but I wanted to give this to you. Again, it's targeted instruction. Use universal design for learning. Um, think of the positive behavior supports when you're, when you're doing explicit instruction. Um, flexible grouping. Again, you've got to know your students to know what groups they're going to work in. How collaboration works with kids. Um, the bottom line is use evidence-based practices, especially with regards to instruction. Um, just because you find it on Teacher Pay Teacher and it's real cute does not mean it's research-based. Okay. Multisensory instruction, um, again, it's learning through two or more pathways. So um, you're using visual skills, auditory skills, tactile skills, kinesthetic skills. That's being able to move around and about. So that's kind of like the project-based learning that we're talking about. It's doing something with the information that you're learning, moving it around in space. Um, it allows for kids to connect learning in new ways and build pathways in the brain. If you guys have seen research that kids learn so much faster through play than they learn by us sitting down and teaching them. So. Um, when you guys work with your kids with dyslexia, I know that you will work, um, that you'll figure out the things that work for you and you'll research it and you'll use it. Hopefully you'll be able to come back to this. I don't expect you to walk away with it today. Um, but think of ways that you can get kids up and moving and um, kids and your older kids too, because you will see them. If they have to present something, they're going to learn it better. That's probably why you guys are gonna have to present something. Vocabulary. Um, vocabulary is a big piece with regards to dyslexia. I'm going to leave this here. Um, but just know that don't talk to your little bitties in baby talk. Give them the rich vocabulary that you guys have learned and that you know. They need those words. So some other things for a student that's struggling, again, it's, it's important to know, it's important for them to know that they can be successful in something else. They might not be a rock star in gymnastics or in the theater, or they may not have some superpower, that's a big word these days, but they do excel in something. And it may be up to you guys to help them figure out what that is and what they enjoy and what they love and bring that into their life as well. Talk about um, individuals with dyslexia and how they are successful. Um, and reinforce that it has nothing to do with intelligence. These kids are smart. They are doing what they can with what they have until we give them the instruction that they need. Um, I already mentioned audiobooks, using computers, using apps. Um, we've already talked about rulers. Um, that might help with focus, but again, it's not going to fix things. Um, emotional support, again, like most learning disabilities, um, 
kids with dyslexia struggle with a lot of emotional baggage that come along with that. Um, they may feel embarrassed, especially for reading out loud, but other things as well. Um, give them opportunities to learn about that. Um, help them identify that. Again, not publicly. Do not do this in front of a group of kids. But when you're talking to them in a one-on-one, -on -one quiet way, um, you can help them by identifying what they're struggling with and identifying that as a tendency or a characteristic of dyslexia and give them a name for that. Praise their hard work even when the results aren't perfect. Um, sometimes it, you just have to say, I know you've worked super hard on this and they need to hear that positive support. Um, identify strengths that you can and combat that self-talk. Uh, negative self-talk, sorry, uh, because you will hear kids, and again, not just kids with dyslexia, but you'll hear the kids saying, I'm so stupid, I can't do this, I don't like it because blah, 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 help them um, work through that. So validate what they're saying. What they're saying is what they're feeling. It is their perspective, um, but also give them reasons to think otherwise. Um, be realistic about it. Listen to them. Give them a safe place. You will hear for years and years and years to come. When you give your kids a safe place to come to you and talk to you and validate their feelings, they will be the kids that come back and say, Mr. Smith or whoever was my favorite teacher. He just made me feel heard. Um, may not be that they, he or she taught you English or taught you Spanish or taught math or geometry or whatever, those teachers that kids say, this was my favorite teacher, if you ask them why, they will say they listened. They listened to me, they made me feel heard. Um, Dr. Brown talks about putting things in context, um, help them identify what exactly is upsetting them, and then um, help give them a statement um, to, to rephrase that. <coughs> Uh, model positive self-talk. Uh, we talk about this a lot with our kids. Um, don't say, oh my gosh, I'm so fat. And then your younger kids pick that up too and, and they take that on. Um, correct the record. Again, if you're in the midst of saying something negative about yourself or about a situation, correct yourself and acknowledge that you did that. Um, so use those moments as a teachable moment. So if you're going to walk out of here with one thing, this is what I would want it to be. Let's change what we say. Um, on the no side are some of the things that some of our students have, hear, have heard and it really has sunk in deep with them. Not all kids go to college. This was told to a kindergarten student. You're obviously not doing your reading homework because you're just not getting any better. Um, the teacher actually said to a student, you are not a shining star. The kid doesn't want to learn. He's lazy and inattentive. And this one hit me hard. A special ed teacher told one of our kids, you are just unable to be taught. We of all folks should be saying, we have all the possibilities. Let's figure them out together. Instead, let's say things like, you are successful at a lot of things. Let's figure those out. Let's list them. Let's do this together. Just because a kid is struggling through one piece, they need someone to partner with them. Let's do this together. Um, for them, again, we've talked about the oral responses. Tell me what you understand in this situation. That can help you know what they don't understand. It can help them be successful in saying, hey, this is the part that I get, and this is the part that I stink at or I don't understand. Compliment them when you can. You're working really hard. When you see them focused and you see them trying their best, just give them a pat on the back. You're working really hard, dude. I'm appreciating you right now. Ask them, how can I help? Sometimes those kids will be able to tell you, I need extra time. This part is really confusing to me. And it may be something small that you can fix in that moment. It may not be, but if you can, we can. 
Let's highlight the important information. When you've got a page of stuff and there's a couple of sentences in there that you need that kid to remember, help them go through and highlight those. If we don't have to remember the whole thing, they can come back and get the rest later. Let's figure out the important stuff. Um, and then think on how can we use assistive technology to help. Again, there is so much available and out there. We're not doing our kids right if we are not using assistive technology to help them um, in most situations. So the Oklahoma Dyslexia Handbook, it is on our um, main page on the special education tab. So if you go to the Oklahoma State Department of Education website, go to the services tab, go down to special education, you'll find our policy and procedure manual. Right underneath that will be the Dyslexia Handbook. It looks like this. There are about 20 of us um, from across the state that were um, put on this task force um, to present to the governor. We worked last year um, on this handbook. We took some of the information from other state departments of education and other states, um, a ton of research on dyslexia, on assessment. Um, so right now we don't have printed copies out there. There's still a couple of typos. We've got them fixed, but we don't have it up on the website yet. It's my fault. Um, but we'll get that up there and then we'll probably start printing after that. Um, but you're welcome to download it and print it. It's about 150 something pages. Um, but you can also um, pull it up um, and just look at it on um, the website free as well. Super important. It's got all kinds of evaluation information in there, much more detail than I can go through today, and um, to talk a little bit more about intervention. So, and the link will be down there at the bottom for you as well. Um, so, you want to talk about intervention and what to walk out of here with. Um, and I left that piece out on purpose. Um, because none of you are going to walk out of here and be a dyslexia expert today. But I wanted you to know what it is. I wanted you to know what we can do with it, um, that it is possible to remediate, um, that we can help kids with dyslexia be very, very successful um, in school and in their life. Um, so when we were looking at intervention, um, you do need research-based intervention models. Most of them are going to be Orton-Gillingham based, or OG for short, Orton-Gillingham. There are tons of programs out there. Most districts have something, although I've talked to about four districts this week that don't have any program at all um, for their kids with reading difficulties. You're not going to fix it if you don't. You're not helping these kids just by giving them homework help. They're not learning to read that way. Um, and that, so that's where we need to go, and that will be our next step, um, is to bring those in too. Um, as a State Department of Education, we won't mandate any specific or endorse really any specific program for school districts other than to say you need a evidence-based program for working with your kids with, that have been identified with reading disabilities and dyslexia. Um, and most of those are going to be Orton Gillingham based. I mentioned Wilson programs. Um, you're welcome to look into those. That's one um, that is, um, I know there are some districts in Oklahoma uses, that use it, but it is very costly. Um, Take Flight is the one Payne Education uses, um, and um, a couple of other clinics here in Oklahoma City use that. Um, other districts use that as well. Um, Barton, Susan Barton's program is a very popular one. Um, it's probably one of the lower cost ones and all the training is on YouTube online. And um, so parents can access that very readily, um, but do not tell a parent that they need to go get Barton stuff and they need to teach their kids how to read. That's our responsibility as schools. The parents can support their kids, just let me know. That's out there. Um, if you Google Orton Gillingham programs, you're going to get a big list. There is no quick fix. There's no easy fix. There's no snake oil. So if you see something, and I had a guy probably my first week here call me from England saying he had the fix for dyslexia. He needed six weeks and he could fix any kid with dyslexia. Um, and I said, thank you so much. It was fun talking to you. Click. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, both by teachers and by the students. 
and so it takes more than six weeks and it does take an evidence-based research program. There are a lot out there um, and school districts are looking into those and so that's really important. It's hot in here <laughs> and I know you guys have had lunch. What questions do you have for me? You get a child diagnosed. What do you do to get a child diagnosed? Um, so you'll refer them for special education testing within the school district. If they already have, if they've already been diagnosed as a student with a reading disability or a specific learning disability, they should already be receiving services. Evidence based Horton Gillingham method based services. So whatever your district's process is for referring for special education testing, usually that starts with the school counselor. Rarely does it start with the special education teacher. It may start through the RTI process often. The kid's already been identified as a struggling reader in elementary. Um, the resource that I have used for, uh, I was doing interventions was a Florida Center for Reading Research. So when I was thinking about even asking that, I tried to dig on the website. I found they've done some studies and they got a grant. I'm very happy to know it, but you know, does anybody use Florida Center for Reading Research for help? Mm -hmm. They have resources and I found they get. Yeah. So yeah, 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 no, they have tons of resources for this doesn't get a specific. Not familiar right off the top of my head, but yeah. Florida State, repeat that again. Florida Center for Reading Research. Yeah. Florida, Florida Center for Reading Research. Um, Dr. Herford is from Pittsburgh State University in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and his program is the Reading Center, R E A D I N G, the Reading Center. Um, and so he's also, he does, he has done a lot of evaluations for kids in Oklahoma because their parents have taken them up there because their school is saying, we don't we don't diagnose dyslexia. Well, if the school is wrong, the school is going to go, to go through a due process <laughs> so because of it. So again, if you're hearing these things in your district, please have your administrators give us a call and we'll help explain it to them. It doesn't have to be an adversarial thing. It, it needs to be a supportive thing and we're happy to support districts through that process. It's a slow turn. We're, we're turning a cruise ship here. We're not we're not in a hovercraft. We're not. We're not on a, a zero-turn radius lawnmower in a helicopter. Uh, we're turning a big cruise ship. It's going to take time to change the dialogue in Oklahoma, but we're working on that. So it takes everybody. It's going to take all of us working together. And it is complex. It is, and we're learning more. There's more research coming out every day. Lots of neurological research, which is fascinating. So read about reading science in the brain. Dr. Sally Shaywitz and her family are probably the leading researchers. Um, Kilpatrick is another leading researcher in the field of dyslexia. Uh, but just know, just like most other things, like autism and every other thing, you're going to hear all the things that don't really cause it. Vaccinations don't cause autism. <laughs> there are just as much yucky information out there about dyslexia and reading disabilities as there are any other thing. So um, look at your research. The International Dyslexia Association, IDA for short, um, I can't think of what their website is, but if you Google International Dyslexia Association, they are the go-to folks for everything dyslexia. Most of the infographics that I used came from that um, website. If you can find it there, then you're probably in good, good practice. So. 